Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We have spent a lot of time focusing on indefinite integrals. And in this video, I want to move back to definite integrals. And now we've seen if the upper and lower bounds for a definite integral are just finite numbers, the process of moving from an indefinite integral to a definite integral is relatively simple. We just solve the indefinite integral. And then we take the, we evaluate the solution at the upper bound and subtract it from the evaluation at the lower bound. It's just one extra step. It's usually just like a calculator problem. Now, I want to continue talking about definite integrals today, but what I want to do is I want to shift the focus to the case where at least one of the bounds of integration is infinite. So let's start with an example here. Let's imagine I give you the function y is equal to e to the minus x over two. Okay, so we know that as x goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero. Let me sketch it out for us. So we have x, y, and in this case, say right here is at one, uh, it shouldn't quite be touching, but it is an exponential decay, so it goes very, very, very fast. So one thing that you could say is if you were asked to solve this, say 0 to infinity of e to the minus x over 2 dx, you could say, well, that's an infinite region, so this thing can't have an, uh, a finite area. But it, this is actually not the case. As we're going to see, this area contained inside of, or contained between the x-axis and the function uh, y equal to my, uh, e to the minus x over two is actually finite. And this comes from the fact that our function goes to zero very, very fast. So that tells us that the region that is contained when x is really, really large, so way up here maybe, is so, so small, and it's getting small extremely fast. Okay, so then what we can do instead, or at least to start, is we can integrate this up to some finite number. So let's just say, uh, let's make up some number b, and we can just use our sort of old school integration techniques here to find this area in here. And we're going to call that area a of b. It's the area that depends on what you choose for b. So it's going to be a function again. But now, this isn't actually that hard to do because we can say that a of b is equal to the integral from 0 to b of e to the minus x over 2 dx, which we're probably getting pretty good at solving these, uh, these integrals. So now, we can do the indefinite integral, we find the antiderivative. So in, that, in our case, it's minus two e to the minus x over two. And since b is finite, this is just a regular definite integral, right? If, you, if, you, if the b is what's confusing you, just put 10 or 100 or 1,000 in there as a placeholder. This is just another variable. And so what this really tells us is that we get minus two e to the minus b over two plus two. And now what we wanna do formally, if you look at the area of b, well, if you let this upper bound here, so this thing gives this in the limit when b goes to infinity. So then what we can do is we can evaluate a limit. We can say, what is the limit of this area as b goes to infinity. And in this case, because we have an explicit representation for a of b, we get minus two e to the minus b over two plus two. Now, the, the last term on there is a two, it's completely constant, it's not changing with b, but the first term here is going to go to zero as b goes to infinity. And so, the total area underneath that curve from zero to infinity is equal to two. And we would write this as saying this integral, this 
this improper integral e to the minus x over two dx should be really thought of as a limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from zero to b of e to the minus x over two dx, which we have just shown is equal to two. Now, there's not really a whole lot that's different here, right? The only thing that we've really uh, added to complexify the situation is the fact that one of the bounds of integration can be infinite and you just treat this as a limit the same way you treat any sort of infinity in calculus. So let me, let me summarize this with a little definition. And we're going to say that integrals with infinite limits of integration integration uh, these are called, I'll put this in red so we can emphasize the name, improper integrals of type one. So that probably makes you guess that there's going to be a second type. That will be the focus of the next video. But what this tells us is that we can break this down into three cases. So we say if f of x is continuous, on the interval a to infinity, then this improper integral a to infinity of f of x dx is really the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So what we just saw in the previous example with e to the minus x over two. But of course, you could do this in the opposite direction. You could ask yourself what happens if uh, the lower extremity or the lower bound on integration is minus infinity. So we will say if f of x is continuous on, say, minus infinity to b, then the integral from minus infinity all the way to b of f of x dx. This is the limit as a goes to minus infinity of the definite integral from a to b of f of x. OK, so then let me uh, put one more up here. There's definitely the case where we go over all of space, minus infinity to minus infinity. In this case, we're not going to double up on the limit. What we're going to say is that if f of x is continuous everywhere, so on the entire real numbers, then we can break up the improper integral from minus infinity to infinity by introducing some arbitrary stopping point. So now we've got a case two integral and then plus a case one integral. And both of those can be handled using limits just like I showed right here with case one and case two. And in this case, C is any real number. So this is mostly just for notation. I imagine that when you're solving this on your own, once you start getting good at it, you're never going to put that C in there. I can say personally, I typically don't. I like to skip that step. But of course, you know, when we start out with it, while I'm doing examples here, uh, of course, we are going to uh, use, uh, use C. And you can, it can be anything you want. You can see from our, our properties of definite integrals, if you need to go way, way back in the lectures, uh, you can see that this C isn't gonna make a difference, right? That's from the fundamental theorem of calculus. The value of C is gonna be canceled once you find the antiderivatives anyways. This is just to break it up so you can see how it's actually done. Instead of saying something like the limit as A goes to minus infinity and B goes to infinity, right? That doesn't quite make sense. So we wanna break up this thing into two components for which you just have a single limit being taken in each case. Okay, sure. That's exciting, right? It's nothing really that, that new. The only new thing, again, is that we introduced a limit in here. So let's do some examples. 
let's um, let's find the area under the curve y equal to the natural logarithm of x uh, divided by. So I don't need the the brackets around that. Try and make it as clean as possible. Divided by x squared uh, from x equal to one to x equal to infinity. Okay. So just in case you're wondering what this looks like, just so you can visualize this. So here we get at one, the function is zero. So right here, and there's a little bit of a, a, a blip and then very quickly that thing levels out and goes down to infinity or down to zero. Again, I'm not an artist. I apologize for the unpretty picture here, but I think you get the gist at the very least. So this is an improper integral of type one. The upper limit of integration is equal to infinity. So from Right here, this tells us that we should set this up in terms of a definite integral from a to b, in our case where a is equal to one, b is anything, and then we can hit it with a limit. So let's do the, the one to b integral first. Now, here's the great thing. We have all of these techniques for solving integrals at our disposal. So the question is, which one of them should we use? Now, th there's a general um, rule that I like to use when I see a, a logarithm function, ln of x, and I see um, x to the power of something as well, then I probably want to use uh, integration by parts. And the reason for that is because when I use integration by parts, the ln of x turns into x to the power of something. In fact, it's x to the power of minus one. So I'm going to use integration by parts here. Now, I want to differentiate away one of these terms, and that is going to be ln of x. And that means that I have one over x squared in here as well. So then v is equal to minus one over x, and u prime is equal to one over x. So I'm using the integration by parts formula for this. And then I get u times v, so ln of x times minus one over x, in this case running from one to b, minus the definite integral from one to b of minus one over x, so that's v, and then u prime is one over x dx. And so, if you'll allow me, I'll continue scribbling this down here because I'm kind of running out of room. I don't want to squeeze that in and make it too ugly. Now let's do the evaluations first. So this will give me ln of b, sorry, minus ln of b divided by b plus ln of one divided by one. Now we know that ln of one is equal to zero. So this term will disappear. And now we get uh, the indefinite integral, or sorry, the definite integral of one over x squared. So that minus in there is going to cancel with the minus down front. And so now we're just left to integrate up x squared, which we've actually already done. So this is going to leave us with minus one over x, which as well is running from one to b. And so when you put all this together, you get minus ln of b over b minus one over b plus one. And so from that note that we just had on the previous page, it tells us that therefore the integral from one to infinity of ln of x over x squared dx, this is the same as the limit as b goes to infinity from one to b of ln of x over x squared dx. 
which now we've already solved. So this is the limit as B goes to infinity of minus ln of B over B minus one over B plus one. And the two on the back there, those are much easier. And so uh, we can see that the one over B term goes to zero, the constant term one goes to one. And now we're just left with evaluating this piece. Actually, I don't wanna put this in brackets. This is minus, sorry, minus ln of B divided by B and put all that in a square bracket. And then the rest I can take the limit of right away. So now the question is, how do I evaluate this limit? Well, as B goes to infinity, this thing becomes uh, minus infinity over uh, infinity. So it's an indeterminate form. So I can use L'Hopital's rule, right? So let's do this. So continuing with what we had, remember when I use L'Hopital's rule, I like to tell people I did it. So I put L apostrophe HR for L'Hopital's rule. And this now becomes the limit as B goes to infinity of minus one over B. That's the derivative of minus ln of B uh, with respect to B and then divided by one. And we still have the plus one sitting out front. And so if we want to simplify this, this is the same as minus one over B plus one, which this piece is equal to zero, this limit. And so this gives me an area of one underneath that curve. So again, nothing, uh, I, in my opinion at least, nothing too, uh, too difficult really. Again, the only thing that we've really introduced here is an extra limit. Okay, then let's keep going with some examples. So example two here, let's evaluate the integral from minus infinity to infinity of one over one plus x squared. Well, this has infinite uh, limits on both ends of this uh, definite integral. So we're gonna use part three. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it up at, at zero. So you get to pick C, this is how this works. You can break it up at one for all you, for if you want, or you can break it up at pi or minus pi or wherever you want. I'm gonna break it up at zero. It's right in the middle and it's, uh, it's gonna make the integral much easier. You can write A in there if you want, or C, and then you can choose afterwards. You don't have to pick right away, but I know what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna choose zero here. So this is the same as uh, the integral from minus infinity to zero of this, and then plus the integral from zero to infinity of dx over one plus x squared. Okay. So let's deal with each one of these terms individually. So first, the integral from minus infinity to zero of dx over one plus x squared. Let's use the proper definition here. This is the limit as a goes to minus infinity of a to zero of dx over one plus x squared. Now one plus x squared, one over one plus x squared, this should be an integral that you're very familiar with, especially if you've been doing lots of problems on partial fractions. And so this comes out to be the uh, inverse of tangent, so tan inverse. And this is running from a to zero. And so now we get the limit as a goes to minus infinity of, uh, tan inverse of zero minus tan inverse of a. And tan inverse of zero is equal to zero. So I get zero minus the limit as a goes to minus infinity of tan inverse of a. So the backward limit of tan inverse, this one might take a little bit of looking up in a table maybe, but this is equal to minus pi over two. And so the whole thing is equal to pi over two. Now you can basically do the same thing for the integral for the positive part of this. 
So you get the integral from zero to infinity of dx over one plus x squared dx. Now we've already found the antiderivative. So let me just throw that in. So this is actually the limit as b goes to infinity of tan inverse of x running from zero to b, right? So I skipped this step right here, the analogous step, uh, just because I, as you can see, I'm kind of running out of room on this page. And so you kind of get the same thing. You get the limit as b goes to infinity of tan inverse of b and then minus zero, right? Tan inverse of zero again is zero, so it's not gonna make a difference. Now you can see why I chose to split it up at zero, right? Because it's it's just like the easiest thing that you could you can calculate here. But you can use any other number. It'll still it'll still cancel, so you don't have to worry. And in this case, the forward limit of tan inverse is pi over two. And so thus, the entire integral over all of space of one over one plus x squared, that's pi over two plus pi over two, which is equal to exactly pi. So that's pretty cool, right? Again, not that much more difficult. We have all of these great techniques for finding uh, the antiderivatives through indefinite integrals. Moving to definite integrals, in my opinion, is not that much more difficult because you're just plugging in upper and lower bounds. And in this case, we just put one extra step on the end and we said, okay, now you have to take some limits to do this appropriately. Okay, so then let's look at one last example here. And I wanna do a general case. I wanna ask you for what values of P, uh, well, greater than zero, but it won't matter, it'll come out. Um, does the integral this from one to infinity of x, uh, sorry, dx over x to the p converge? So we need, we mean convergence in the sense of the limit, and we need, mean essentially the convergence as b goes to infinity. Of the, uh, of the limit of this definite integral from one to B, okay? And we would like to know, ideally, you know, when it converges, uh, what is exactly the value of its, uh, that it converges to? Okay, so the, the first thing is we have two cases. P not equal to one, and p equal to one. And we know that these are the two cases because when we're typically tasked with finding this antiderivative, we have to break it up into the case where n is equal to one and n, or sorry, n is equal to minus one and n is equal to, uh, or not equal to minus one. So let's start with p not equal to one. So logarithm is not gonna show up, right? So in this case, we get an integral from one to b of dx over x to the p. In this case, you just need to add one to the exponent. So the one over makes it a minus. So you can think of this, if you'd like actually, just to make it more clear, x to the minus p dx. And so this becomes x to the minus p plus one. So because p is not equal to one, that power actually exists and then one minus p, that's the same as minus p plus one, and integral from one to b, which is equal to one over one minus p, b to the minus p plus one minus one. And if you'd like, you can also write this in terms of a fraction that might look a little easier to handle there. And so this tells us, so thus, the integral from one to infinity of dx over x to the p, this is the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from one to b of dx over x to the p, which is now the limit as b goes to infinity of one over one minus p, p is fixed, b is the thing that's going to be varying. 
And now you can see that if your, uh, your, your one over B to the power of P minus one, you need to determine whether or not that thing is convergent. And that thing is going to be convergent so long as the power on B is positive. It's going to sink this thing. If the power is negative, then B flips up to the top of the fraction again. And B going to infinity means the fraction goes to infinity. The only way that fraction can go to zero is if B stays on the bottom. So this tells us that we get two cases. We get one over one minus P. I'm going to write this sort of informally for a second uh, times minus one because the, the fraction in B will disappear when P is larger than one, that's when P minus one is positive. Otherwise it's infinite when P is less than one. And so this really tells me if I multiply in the one over one minus P that I get one over P minus one when P is bigger than one and I still get infinity when P is less than one. So we see that we have convergence when uh, p is greater than one, and we have divergence, this thing, this, this indefinite, or this definite integral doesn't converge as b goes to infinity when p is less than one. Okay, so now what about p equal to one? Well, in this case, let's do it all in one, uh, one swift motion. So we actually get the integral of one to infinity of dx over x which is the limit b goes to infinity, one to b dx over x. Now this is looking for the antiderivative of one over x. That's the logarithm. So this is b goes to infinity, logarithm of x from one to b, which is the logarithm of b minus zero, the logarithm, so I'll write it and then I will use my arrow to show that this is zero. But as B goes to infinity, the natural logarithm goes to infinity. So this thing is equal to infinity. And that is to denote, i.e. it diverges. And so that tells us that this integral one over x to the power of p is only going to converge when p is larger than one. Basically, you need a high enough power on the denominator in order to sink this fraction fast enough as x goes to infinity. You need to leave so little room you know, for very, very large b and beyond that uh, you know, this, there's actually going to be a finite area under here. It's the same type of idea we saw with the first problem here with the exponential function. Because this thing goes to zero so fast, you're left with so, so little room when you're really, really far away from where you started. And because of that, you get a finite convergence to the integral. Okay, so we can see that the process really isn't that much more complicated. It just involves adding an extra limit in here. But the application of this is extremely important, right? Because this allows us to handle uh, in uh, integrals with infinite limits of integration. Now, the other thing that we saw here is that uh, we refer to these things as improper integrals of type one. So as you can guess, there's probably a type two. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next video when we look at how to integrate up to vertical asymptotes now. So instead of X going to plus or minus infinity, we're gonna talk about Y going to plus or minus infinity.